Yeah, there we go, Alan. Did you hear that? <laughs> Greetings from Toronto, everyone, on the shores of Great Lake, Ontario. This is Andrew McDonald of the PAC Next team. I'll be your moderator today. And we'll just wait a minute or two while everyone has a chance to join in. Uh, great to have you with us. If you've just joined, uh, bear with us for about one more minute. We'll just let, uh, let folks join in and then we'll get started. Alrighty, well, once again, early fall greetings from Toronto, Ontario. Everyone, great to have you with us, tuning in from Canada, the US, and beyond. My name is Andrew McDonald. I'm the project manager for PAC Next, PAC's program of sustainability and circularity initiatives. And before we get going, just a couple of, couple of important items. PAC Next has an aspirational goal of a world without packaging waste. So the PAC Next team, here we are before you, and Alan Blake is joining us today from the UK. Dan Lance is back in Ontario from some time out west, and I'm here in Toronto. Uh, our team offers you a wealth of knowledge, experience, and resources related to packaging sustainability and circularity especially through our education and training opportunities like these. So please have a look at these. Uh, details and registration information can be found on our website, which is pack.ca there at the bottom of the screen. And we hope you join us for some or all of these upcoming events in the next few months. So let's get to it. Here's our agenda for today. I'm gonna offer you about a 15 minute demo of the PIP360 tool. Then we're gonna hear from Louis Lemaire and Lucas Martinovich, uh, who will share their stories of using the tool with their customers. Then we'll turn it over to, or I'll turn it over to Dan Lance, um, master architect of PIP360, who will describe how we intend to improve the tool based on feedback we've had from our users since we launched the tool back in January. And then we'll have time for Q&A and we look forward to your questions. So let's, uh, let's get right to it. And I'm going to go to the uh, PAC. So it's the PIP360 uh, website. And if you just bear with me for a moment, Exit there, and here we are. So just a few minutes of background, and then we'll get into the tool itself. So why do we create PIP360 in the first place? It's well established. We're dealing with big ticket global challenges, finite resources, climate change, ocean pollution, and so on. And certainly packaging waste has become a global issue that connects with all of these issues. 
We see governments and industry responding either on their own or as part of collaborations like the Ellen MacArthur Foundation led network of global plastics pacts, such as the Canada Plastics Pact, which launched back in January and PAC is an implementation partner of the CPP. So many related targets have been set for 2025 and 2030 related to reuse, recyclability, compostability, recycled content, and so forth. Reaching these targets requires setting baseline ass assessments and ongoing tracking to measure progress. And PIP360 was created to help with both of those activities. So a very brisk background to PIP360. Two years ago, PAC established a, a PIP360 Leadership Council. And so I will, under the about and overview. So as you see here, leading retailers, brand owners, packaging manufacturers, waste management folks, municipalities, associations, government observers, et cetera, all rolled up their shirt sleeves and worked with the PAC team to develop what we call a minimum viable product, an MVP tool for the marketplace. So leadership council members, as well as our early adopters, who you see right here, so early users of the tool, uh, worked with the PAC team to develop, to develop the tool. They supplied data, we tested the tool, and on an ongoing basis continue to give us valuable feedback on content, functionality, and ultimately the value of the tool. Value which PNG's Brent Heist describes right here. And I'll, I'll draw your attention to the second line here, which the resulting score is not just a statement of the current packaging circularity, but also serves as a guide to improved circularity. PIP360 is a very well-informed guide to help users save time by providing direction with respect to sustainability and circularity decisions. Along the way, we've been uh, recognized for our efforts, uh, as you see here, including last week as a finalist in uh, Europe's 2021 Sustainability Awards. And so just before we go to the tool, I uh, wanted to flag uh, two things for you on this site, if you come back to this site. First, under the How It Works tab, you have a quick start guide and a full user manual. So please use them. Second, under the About tab, just note that we've offered, we offer you definitions of the terms we use. There's pricing information. PIP360 is offered in bundles of scores. There's member and non-member pricing. We have an exhaustive list of FAQs and we have bios of the team behind the tool. So without further ado, I'll launch the tool. And so on every page on this site, there's a launch tool button in the upper right. So here we go. And so it's easy to get into the tool. If you haven't done it already, you would go to create account and you would supply your email address, just like I'm doing right now. Uh, you'd select a password. And that's it. And please know that every user having done that, you get one free score. And then after that, once you get to the create score spot, then you would, be, you would be asked to pay. But you get that one free score just to run through a package and try it out. So we offer a tour right here, this button. And the tour is, it maps out the four key steps in generating a score. And you see them here. Now for today, I'm your tour. So I'm not going to say anything more about this, uh, but it's here. Uh, for future reference, but I'll just click through the steps and we will get started. And for today, what we're going to do is enter just a generic package product. And we're going to do laundry, folks. Uh, I feel like I do an awful lot of it these days with soccer and other activities 
back on track this fall. So I thought that would be a good one. And before we get going on that, I'll just point out that throughout the tool, we've got these information icons. I'll give you an example, you know, little tips to help you along the way to supplement the user manual that I pointed out earlier. So in this case, if you don't have a SKU, you can use the UPC or whatever other identifier works for you. So things like that to help you along the way. So I'm gonna keep it very simple. Uh, I've come up with a great new product, which you're gonna love, you gotta try it. So you can call it whatever you wish, obviously. So product segment, we've organized the PIP360 world into 25 segments. You, you get an idea of them here. So pick the one that's most appropriate for your product. So step one, we're on the product, uh, at the product stage, each segment has associated family categories. So in this case, uh, cleaning, then you just need to enter the size. So we'll go with a one liter container. The region is Canada. I wanna point out that the tool is set up now for Canada, but it is designed to be readily, um, it will work with any jurisdiction uh, as soon as we have good uh, reliable data for that jurisdiction. So it could be applied really anywhere in the world once we have that good data. For now, it's Canada. So that is step one. Now we'll go to step two, which is to add a package. Just want to make sure I'm yep, on track so far. So easy to do uh, in terms of naming, it's whatever makes sense to you. I'm going to choose version two because we're gonna say that I've already got a, some fantastic laundry soap in the marketplace. And so that relates to the second section. You choose whether you, you already have packaging in the marketplace that you want to score, or is it something potential, a future possibility? So for our demo, that's it, it's potential. Our package is, is recyclable. You have three choices at this stage. And the next section is, says replacement, and this refers to reduction. This is really about reduction and specifically packaging weight reduction. So if I already have my fantastic laundry soap in the marketplace, then I'm gonna enter how much that packaging weighs. So that we're gonna say it weighs 200 grams. And then the next step, we'll, we'll come back to this weight piece. So that's not the weight of my future possibility, it's the weight of the incumbent packaging, if you will. You could add some notes here if you wish, and that's it for step two. We move to step three, and that's to add, so we're getting more granular with each step, product, package, and now we get into the package components. So we are, just need to click on the box. We'll add our jug, and we have seven categories, choose plastic. And a note here, uh, an, an important one, and that is that a key distinguishing feature of PIP360 is that all of the material types that are associated with each category, so in this case, these are all the plastic material types, they're mapped on publicly available recycling rate data. So, so this is for now Canadian-based data, but this is up-to-date data that maps to each of these categories. So for this particular example, we'll choose uh, high density polyethylene bottles and jugs. It is the primary component of our packaging system. We've just got one unit. It's not a group of say 24 water bottles packaged together. It's just a standalone. So here we're back to weight. I said we'd come back to weight, we're back to it. So. In this case, we'll say the jug weighs 160 grams and that we've got, we've managed to work in 125% uh, recycled content. We don't have any renewable material. And that's it. So we're, we're, this is step three of four. We save that. And it brings us to an important page for the user. It's the package detail page. And it summarizes what we've done so far. So I just want to point out to you that at this point, you can edit at all three levels. At the product level, 
at the package level and at the component level. You can make changes. So one can add as many components as you like at this point. If you have 10 components, fine. For today, just two. Uh, we'll, we'll, I wanna add one more just to show you how this works. So we'll add a lid. It's plastic. It's made of polypropylene. It's not the primary, it's so by default, it's other. And we'll say our lid weighs 20 grams. So recall at the beginning, we said this package is replacing an original package, which weighed 200 grams. So the jug plus the lid totals 180. So we've reduced it, we've lightweighted a bit. Uh, no recycled content or renewable in the lid. And we save it. So again, you see, now you, you go back to the package detail page and here we go. So for today, that's it, just nice and simple. And we go to step four. So step four is to create a score. And so we are challenged here just to say, okay, please double check, make sure the, the data you've inputted is correct. Because once we create a score, that is baked. So we can't go back and adjust that entry but I'll show you a way to duplicate a package and, and add it in a moment. But once we're satisfied that what we put in is correct, we continue to our score page. And I'll very briskly walk you through the scorecard. There are four sections starting at the top. It's a summary of the, uh, the information you've input. So you can just double check that that's correct. And of course the score. So that's score of 123 out of 360. Second section are pathways. So these are high level pathways. Recall the Procter & Gamble testimonial I shared with you earlier, the tool is a guide. And so these are guides to, as catalysts for conversation, to think about things that one could do to further improve the circularity of one's package. The third section, is about comparisons. So we are working toward having sufficient data that would, in the database, we're working toward that so that we can aggregate data and then situate one's package in relation to and compared with other like packages. So that's what this third section, that's the functionality it will provide. And lastly, it says uncertified score here because at this point, you know, there's been, there is no third party validation of the score, but that is a service we're considering for future versions of the tool. So uh, one can, you can download uh, a, PDF for, a PDF version of your score with this button, but for the moment, I'm gonna just close it because one last thing is part of the demo that I wanna share with you. Users time and time again say, I want to compare and contrast. I really want to play around with the tool. And so a simple but very handy bit of functionality is the duplicate package uh, button. And so we've created this version two of, in this particular instance, so we can select duplicate package. You see the only difference is it's now V2 copy. So you could easily just, you rename it, you edit and rename, you call it whatever you wish, V3, uh, and then you can edit. So I'll just do one edit just to show you what that looks like. Let's say, oh, good news. We were able to uh, reduce a little bit more. We were able to increase the recycled content with some you know, new innovation. And you save that, create score, continue and okay. So we've got a fresh, a fresh scorecard to add to the conversation. And it's this kind of thing we're gonna hear about, this kind of compare and contrast from Louis and Lucas shortly. So that is it for my demo of the tool today. So again, if you have questions, please avail yourself of the uh, Q&A box, you should see it at the top or bottom of your screen if you haven't already. We look forward to your questions. And now I'm just going to exit this. And if you just bear with me a moment.
we will, we're back to our, back to our show here. And so I am very pleased to introduce our presenters, uh, starting with Louis Lemaire and then Lucas, uh, Lucas's PR team declined uh, a photo, but we will, we will see Lucas live in just a few moments, but Louis is up first. And so I'm delighted to welcome you, Louis. Louis has been part of the fiber-based community for over 28 years. Louis's passion for sustainability has seen him work with many consumer packaged goods companies to develop packaging solutions with minimal environmental impact. So Louis represents uh, GPI and associations such as PPEC, which is the Paper and Paperboard Environmental Council, RPA, the Recycled Paperboard Alliance, and PAC as well. So Lou, Louis, great to have you with us today, and I'll turn it over to you. And of course, just cue me when you'd like me to advance the slides. Great, thank you, Andrew. Uh, good morning, everybody, good day. I hope you're having a, a great day and that you're enjoying the webinar so far. Um, as Andrew mentioned, I work for Graphic Packaging, which is a 100-year-old company plus uh, that produces fiber-based packaging. We're vertically integrated, which means we have our paperboard mills and we convert our paperboard into about uh, 90 facilities around the world to manufacture items like coffee cups, uh, takeout food containers, cereal boxes, beverage carriers, and other products that are uh, fiber-based. Uh, next. Andrew, thank you. So um, as you know, most corporations today have uh, environmental and social and governance commitments. Uh, companies have objectives. They have commitments to reduce the environmental impact of their packaging, of their products. And uh, as such, the PIP 360 uh, is being used uh, by GPI and, and other companies to uh, get a circularity assessment tool. Uh, Andrew, next. So the, the, the PIP 360, we've used it uh, both internally and with customers to uh, have a, a comparison, to have a set of, of comparison between two different types or two or three or more different types of packaging for the same product. We know it's not an LCA, it's not a, a life cycle analysis. Uh, it, it is a quick, it's an affordable, and it's an easy to use tool that allows us to get results either for the ESG KPIs or to compare uh, two or more types of packaging for the same product. So um, next, I can jump in and uh, talk about uh, two different project, projects that we have used <clears throat> for me the, the PIP 360. The first one was um, we uh, wanted to replace a PET transparent foil wrap uh, with a fiber-based type of packaging. So uh, the intent here is to reduce the use of plastic with some material that is more uh, recyclable and less impactful to the environment. Next. So in this particular case, um, the foil wrap came in with a, a value of 21 on the PIP 360 scale. Uh, the packaging is very light, but it is not recyclable. It's not compostable and doesn't come from a renewable source. The paperboard carton that we came up with uh, although it is heavier in weight than the original packaging, uh, it is recyclable. It's, uh, it comes from a renewable source. And in this case was 100% recycled content as well. In some uh, basis weights, the paperboard is actually also considered uh, compostable, but that's a different story. Uh, so in this case, it was, it was quite a, um, uh, an improvement in terms of wanting to reduce the environmental impact of the packaging of this product and going from a score of 21 to 294. Next, Andrew. The second project, um, we, uh, we use this internally uh, to compare a polypropylene container with the lid 
uh, compared to a paperboard packaging solution that we uh, came up with. In this particular case, you can go to the next page, Andrew. In this particular case, the paperboard option actually came in a little bit lighter, which is uh, a little bit unusual when we talk about doing comparison between plastic and paperboard. But the PP container came in with a score of 112 on a possible 360. This particular container that we, uh, that we compared was actually reusable. So we considered in, in uh, inputting the data in the tool, we considered that it could be reused five to 10 times, uh, but it is not uh, commonly recycled in Canada. It is not compostable and it comes from a non-renewable source. The paperboard option that we came up with, uh, the packaging, like I said, was, was slightly lighter than the, uh, than the PP container. Um, it was also um, uh, recyclable. It comes from a renewable source, but it is not reusable. Uh, nonetheless, the result uh, came in at 312 in comparison to the initial score of uh, 112. Andrew? So uh, to the age old question of uh, what weighs more between a ton of bricks versus a ton of feathers? Well, my 2.0 version to that is what is preferable? A ton of non-recyclable, non-recycled material that comes from a non-renewable source or two tons of a recyclable material that comes from a renewable source. So uh, the, 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 the debate is there. Um, the tool is there to help us make those decisions, to have a comparison. And um, like I said, we, we have found the tool very useful to uh, provide solutions to our customers and to evaluate different types of packaging internally in our uh, NPD department of uh, graphic packaging. That's from me, Andrew. Hey, thanks so much, Louis. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it is really a guide. So for another uh, perspective on the tool, we welcome Lucas Martinovich. Lucas has grown up around the packaging industry. Uh, he has a background in economics and having worked in several manufacturing roles over the years, he is now the sustainability projects coordinator for Silgan Plastics. Lucas collaborates with all Silgan North American operations to identify and implement sustainability improvement projects for both their plants and their products. So without further ado, over to you, Lucas. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew, and uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for uh, making it out today. Um, so I guess we'll go and hop right into things. So PIP360 uh, to us uh, has proven to be a great materials reassurance tool. And uh, that's a term you'll hear me uh, refer to often, using uh, real data to quantify how certain materials perform in the waste streams they are being sold into. Uh, one of the major steps in order for the circular economy uh, to work and get closer to the vision of turning waste into resource, the first step is to do the best we can in making sure that feedstock going into our waste streams can or will be processed into valuable reusable uh, materials. Um, and uh, this is where PIP360 can be used to support packaging decision, uh, the packaging decision-making process uh, quickly, clearly, and cost-effectively in conjunction with uh, many of the LCA tools that we have in the market. Uh, Andrew, if you could hop to the next slide. So here we have uh, just a couple scores, and here's a really classic example of the scenarios we find ourselves going over with many of our customers, and uh, a great way to show how PIP360 helps us quantify these different decisions, benchmark where we are today, and really build a pathway to where we're trying to get to tomorrow. So Silgan Plastics, uh, we are a sustainable, rigid packaging manufacturer uh, with facilities throughout North America. So for this example today, I'm using a rigid, uh, high-density polyethylene bottle. And on the left, we have what I would call sort of our benchmark score, where we see how today, a 100% virgin high density polyethylene bottle scores as far as circularity in today's system. 
Now, as Andrew mentioned earlier, what's really nice is the PIP360 tool uh, does give you um, a sort of gap analysis and suggestions to add to that discussion of how can we get closer to full circularity. The top two being reduction and introduce, introduction of renewable or reusable resources being well within you know all brands control and then that last one being you know relating to the recycling rate slightly outside of our control but of course with new uh, epr initiatives and whatnot uh, you know that gap is closing and you know uh, we're all getting more involved in the overall process so the next two scores we sort of have a classic scenario of do we want to lightweight or do we want to add post-consumer resin and in a perfect world, and we always do work to do this, is we want to do both. But PIP360 here gives us a great example of, uh, or a, a great, quant it quantifies very nicely the two different decisions very clearly. So here we take this bottle that we started with, and if we do a maximized weight reduction, our score goes from a, a nice 65 to 83. So we definitely see progress. But on the flip side, if we also consider keeping the weight the same in this scenario and introducing 25% PCR, we see how impactful that is in the overall circularity score of the product, which is really what we're all working towards. How do we drive to more cradle to cradle packaging? Um, and then finally, uh, when we get over to the next slide, uh, we'll see what I often again refer to is materials reassurance, where if we can run that ideal scenario, PIP360 gives us a, a snapshot of how different substrates perform in today's um, recycling stream. Now, here's an example of, I mean, it is a product we do make, and now we're moving to 100% post-consumer in this uh, post-consumer resin, and in this case made of high-density polyethylene. Uh, in this scenario, we've maximized the usage of post-consumer resin and also maximized the light weighting. And we can see that even today, uh, this, this rigid um, uh, package will score a great 317 out of 360. So it's just a really great way to reassure ourselves that this package in this substrate, in this form, how will it perform in the waste streams that we're selling and any brand selling their products into? And uh, again, as I've said, uh, PIP360 really does prove itself to be a, a great tool um, as we work on this journey of turning really waste into resource. And uh, without further ado, that's about all I have for today. And uh, please feel free to reach out with any questions. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, well said. Uh, and now to our final part of our presentation, I'm going to turn it over to Dan Lance. Before I do, I'll just encourage our wonderful audience to avail yourselves of the Q&A. Um, questions for Louis, Lucas, uh, and then now over to Dan. So Dan is PACNEC's director. Uh, and as I said earlier, really our master architect of the PIP360 tool. So Dan, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, oh, thanks, Andrew. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to every to uh, wherever you may be in the world today. <laughs> it's nice to be back in Ontario. I uh, am just going to introduce to you this afternoon. Next slide, Andrew, please. I'm just going to introduce you the, the changes that we're talking about making in version 2.0. We're hoping to have version 2.0 out in the marketplace uh, in the first quarter of 2022, if all goes well. We have uh, been working for about the last six months or so with our technical advisory team and our leadership council on what changes should be made, could be made, and uh, can be made. Um, the idea is we want to make it more, not uh, sorry, not more user friendly, but provide more information back to the users and give them a little more direction on in terms of what they can do with their packaging to make it more circular. <coughs> So I'm going to go through each one of these key changes uh, that we uh, that we identified earlier and that we're working on right now. Next slide, please, Andrew. <laughs> so the first thing we're doing, the, the key um, in our feedback we got from our leadership council, from the users, our early adopters, from the likes of Lucas and Louis and and others at other companies, was our list of materials was a little too restricted. <laughs> now. In fairness, our list of materials was tied 
exactly to the EPR reporting of Ontario, Quebec, and Manitoba, um, the three programs that we do have re um, recycling rate data available for. So that aside, we still have our, our uh, group say, listen, we need to have more flexibility in terms of where we put it. So we know that we're putting into the right categories. So we added a number of materials. So our paper list went from nine to 17 options. I have not identified the new ones over the old ones. I apologize, I guess I should have done that. What you're seeing is the list as we presented uh, in our Excel model, the, the version two working model that we have on site uh, um, that we use in, inside the company, the group. So the ones that are marked in red are just those that are very limited recycling or not being recycled uh, much in the Canadian marketplace today, and they've been identified. The other ones are limited recycling uh, for reasons of, well, for example, the poly poly coated paper is, is limited in terms of where it can go, so there's a limited recycling. So we're identifying it. Um, but this list was, was identified by our working groups, and we pretty much settled on it. Now, if somebody sees something that we're missing or that we should have in there, we're more than happy to revisit the list. We have not tied this all down. It's, it, you know, it isn't locked in stone. So if you see something, please speak up and we'll be glad to entertain your uh, discussion with you to see about adding the material. Next slide, please. Sorry, I, bear with me, Dan. Thank you. Yeah. So the big, the big, big, big change in version two is PIP 360 is, whoop, you're going backwards there, Andrew. Sorry, it's a little uh, jumpy. There. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the PIP 360 model, PIP uh, pack and PIP 360, we're aligning ourselves with the Canada Plastics Pack and the Gold Design Rules. So the list of plastics that we had, we had 17 originally, which is the 17 that are again in the EPR programs uh, across Canada, but it wasn't recognizing where the Gold Design Rules were going and where Canada Plastics Packs were going with respect to identifying plastics for uh, consideration of replacement, or uh, like Golden Design Rule number two is suggesting that uh, the marketplace. This is not PAC saying this. And please, please note that we're not saying anything. There's, we don't. We're completely packaging neutral. There's no such thing as a good plastic package or a bad plastic package in our minds. But what we're saying is the Golden Design Rules and CPP are pointing in the direction of some things should not be used or should be replaced. And in, the, in this case, their focus is on keeping one, number one, PET, two, HDPE, four, LDPE, and five, polypropylene in the market, and look at replacing other plastics, which um, will allow increased economies of scale. On the other ones, which feeds into the marketplace, because of course, there's a huge demand for recycled content in those other plastic resin grades. It isn't that the other plastics aren't to be used or can't be used, they're just recommending replacing it. The other thing to bear in mind is CPP and the golden design rules are all voluntary. And as such, if you choose not to, it's not like you're going against any um, regulation that's in the country. However, the list, we had a request, the list match where the golden design rules and the Canada Plastics Pact are going. So as you can see, and Andrew, you're all over the map there, Sunshine. <laughs> you keep me on my toes here. Uh, the, the, uh, the list is in line now with the CPP. In fact, we had a meeting with uh, George Roeder last week and George gave us a couple more suggestions that we, add, that we should add in and we have. And uh, so now with this list of 17 to 36, we believe we have a list that is completely compatible, which will be great when you're reporting to CPP on your uh, recycled content and your recycling rates. Next slide, please. The good news is with all this, all these additional things that we've got in here is you still don't have to do any more work other than we've added one more um, thing in there in terms of your percentage non-recycled additives, fillers, barrier layers, et cetera. There are plastic, pa there's plastic packaging in the marketplace that includes, for example, calcium carbonate, a very common additive for a number of plastics. Um, you can't make plastics out of stone. And as such, what we're asking is what is your percentage additive in your plastic packaging? And what we'll do is we'll reduce your recycling rate accordingly by that percentage. So if say you're in PET or sorry, uh, yeah, PET thermoform and you've got some calcium carbonate in there um, of 10%, then you'll reduce your, your PET thermoform recycling rate by 10 percentage points. 
Now, the other thing is that the we're slightly adjusting the inputs. You heard Andrew in his presentation of what's in PIP 360 version one. Version two, we're gonna change just from renewable to renewable being split into forestry certified or equivalent for fibers and bio-based plastics um, and for, for compostables as be certified compostable. So we're again, recognizing where the world is going in terms of what they're going to recognize as packaging that should be put into the marketplace or could, um, the focus of where packaging should be put in the marketplace. And as such, then we're reporting again, back to the users consistent with what uh, the expectation is. Next slide, please. Now, the, the, we are adding one, one element to the scoring. The other ones are still consistent with the, the scoring is staying the same, but the one element we are adding in is packaging intensity. And the, and the reason we're putting in packaging intensity is that um, unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, it was version one, it was a minimum viable product. We got the product out in the marketplace because we wanted people to use it. But if you have a package, for example, that is uh, carrying one liter of milk and weighs 200 grams of glass, and if it carries uh, two liters of milk and weighs 250 grams, they would score the same. And yet the packaging intensity for the two products in the marketplace is very different when you've got uh, you know, 200 grams of glass against one liter versus 250 grams of glass against two liters, then you can see the packaging intensity changes. And so if the packaging weight stayed the same or even increased, regardless of how much you were putting into it, you weren't getting a change in your score. And uh, again, the users told us, well, hold on a second, that doesn't make sense. If I'm getting a better utilization of packaging to product, there should be a reflection in the score of that. And so we've added in packaging intensity to it. Uh, it's very straightforward. It's just packaging weight to product weight. Um, for those of companies, and like I worked with Lucas, for example, what do I do with my packaging? Because it can change, take a weight range. Okay, well, what's the average you're putting it in or what are you selling it to the marketplace as being capable of holding? And that's what we'll do in, in terms of putting in your, your product weight relative to your packaging weight. And so we can get a, a good proper packaging intensity score for your, for your packaging. Next slide, please. Now, we, we really went out on a limb on this one. <clears throat> it, it's, it's accurate. We had a lot of requests. We've had actually a lot of requests since April of, of uh, 2019 when we started this whole process of saying, I'd like to see some form of LCA included. And we've said all along, no, we're not gonna do an LCA. We can't do LCA. First of all, it's too, way too complicated for anybody who's done an LCA. So many factors go into it that for us to do an LCA on every package and a simple, easy to use tool, which is what we wanna keep as a simple, easy to use tool. That's very informative, you know, listening to Louie and Lucas, they were great in explaining that to everybody. But we thought, can we provide anything to the users on how their packaging is doing with respect to greenhouse gas emissions? And the reason we, we stuck with just GHG emissions is that's what everybody's talking about. Everybody says, okay, you know, what are your GHG emissions? We've got GHG emission targets for, for countries and companies and products and packaging, et cetera. And so I said, well, let me see what I can do. So using the WARM model from the US EPA, it's been around for a long time. I used the WARM model back in the early 90s to do an LCA for a client. And it's been updated in 2020 with new emissions factors. It is US-based though, recognizing we're using Canadian recycling rates, but US-based WARM rates because we don't have Canadian averages in, available to us. However, as again, remember listening to what Lucas said, it points you in the right directions. And that's what we're trying to do here is point you in the right direction. So we can now measure your GHG emissions for your package and per gram of package so you can compare it. So you're looking at one package of uh, X weight and another package of another material of Y weight. You can now compare your GHG emissions. But the factor is not going to be used in scoring because it's not a measure of circularity. It's a measure of more uh, sustainable materials management or just GHG against products used. So, but it's a great piece of information and it does meet and uh, helps those who are using our model, uh, give them another little piece of information they can use for decision-making. And that was what was requested. And that's what we're constantly trying to do at PAC is continue to develop the model 
um, meeting the needs and, and uh, requests of, our, of uh, our, our users and where the world wants to go. Next slide, please. The, the other thing that we've got in here is your EPR fees for Canada. Now, respecting that we don't have sales data or anything, what we're doing is taking the EPR fees for the, for the programs that are in Canada where the EPR fees are posted. So that's British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, and Quebec. And assuming that your sales are equivalent approximately to the populations of the country, um, that isn't necessarily right. But again, it, directionally, it tells you that for a package, this is what your EPR fees are going to be approximately across Canada as a whole, again, assuming proportionality to population. So it gives you an average EPR fee for your package. It does not give you the EPR fee, what you're going to pay in British Columbia, for example, versus what you're going to pay in Ontario or Quebec, but it does give you an overall average for the country as a whole. Again, something that was being requested. Uh, we've had a number of people come and say, well, what are my EPR fees going to be for my package? Oh, if I change my packaging, what are my EPR fees going to be? Uh, it's, it's quite interesting to do an analysis of your EPR fees by packaging type. Um, sometimes there's a lot of surprises out there with respect to uh, when you lightweighted your package or go into pouches relative. It doesn't necessarily go in the direction you might think it would. So again, key piece of information, not used in scoring, but a really interesting piece and uh, quite informative for packaging producers and users. Next slide, please. So the other thing we built into this is when you're using the PIP360 model, it's, it's really nice for you to know right away, how are you doing relative to the, the targets of CPP and the golden design rules? Now, of course, the big CPP uh, targets are 50% recycling rate for your plastics, 100% recyclable. So we don't measure whether it's packages recyclable or not. To be honest, in Canada, everything except for multi-laminated plastic pouches are considered recyclable by strict definition of the Competition Bureau. So it's a redundant measure for us, uh, not in the state, in the United States, where we're looking at, we're building the model that we will look at recyclability rates in the U.S. as opposed to recycling rates because recycling rates aren't available for the United States. The other thing that we've got is what is your recycled content? And of course, we've got the targets of, uh, I believe it's 30% by 2030. And so what we can do is we can measure your package against your recycled content against the CPP and Golden Design Rule expectations and report it back to you. So for this package, uh, just so you know, this was a 24 pack of 100% recycled, or sorry, 50% recycled um, uh, PET water bottles. So with non-recycled content caps, which is why it's not 50%. The caps were 0% and as such, they reduced the recycled content from 40 or from 50 to 46.9. So again, we, can, we have this reporting feature. It's now going to be built and baked right into the model. Every package you in, uh, that you input into the PIP360 model, we will give you a report automatically. So now if you took this information multiplied times your sales, you could actually calculate how you're doing um, against your CPP targets for your company as a whole for all plastics that are being used within the firm. So it's uh, again, very informative, provides a lot of value. Um, meeting with the expectations of where our clients want to see it and our uh, commitment to CPP. We're working very, very closely. All, all members, <laughs> Andrew, Jim, Alan, and myself are all participating on the CPP panels and, um, and helping develop the, uh, the go forward approach for the for Canada Plastics Pact. Next slide, please. So, just in conclusion here, the scoring method methodology is being finalized for the second version with the addition of, of, um, of the packaging intensity, plus we're splitting out the fibers into um, certified versus non-certified. That's gonna change scoring because if you're using non-certified fibers, you're not going to get the same score you did in version one. Um, the reason we put that in place is that we were finding in our research that there were some packaging there was some packaging in the marketplace that was not using certified sustainable forest sources. Um, rather, they were using virgin sources that were not sustainable. And as such, we were thinking, well, hold on a second, they shouldn't be given the same score as somebody that's using sustainably sourced fibers. So that's why we're splitting it apart. Um, and the, the bio-based plastics, <clears throat> the reason we're going to show it separately and score it separately is one of the plastics packs in the world, I believe it's Australia, but don't quote me, 
is saying, we understand we're not going to be able to get to the recycled content levels that we want in our through our Australian Plastics Pact. And as such, what's a surrogate for it? And the surrogate is going to be bio-based plastic sources, so non-fossil fuel source plastics. Therefore, we want to be ready if CPP comes to a similar type conclusion. We don't know at this point, it's still too early to tell. But if they do, then we want to be able to say, okay, we're ready to be able to report back for everybody on what their percentage of bio-based plastics are relative to the targets set by CPP. So look for a new online version, hopefully by the end of around the first quarter of 2022. We are using uh, an Excel version right now. We'll be sending it to developers shortly to build into FileMaker and uh, look forward to the next, next version. And I look forward to anybody's comments and questions. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. And that's a perfect cue because we do have some questions. Uh, so I am going to uh, stop share. And if, yeah, there we are, Louis, if you want to come back on screen. And Alan, um, I know you put up your hand to uh, field a couple of the questions that came in from, from the audience. Well, first of all, thanks everyone. Delighted to be with you and, and thank you. Please keep your questions coming in. And I'm not necessarily volunteered to answer them other than I wanted to make sure that they were answered live because I think the ah. question is relevant, <laughs> relevant to everyone. And as you know, who I'm going to direct these questions to, it's going to go to Dan, of course. But let's just take this question because they're all great questions. Uh, and, you know, how does the tool take into account the impact on recyclability of mixed materials, Dan? So here, the examples given of paper labels on an HDPE package. So what happens with that package is the paper label will be entered as a non-recycled element of your package because the main package element is your HDP. So say it's a detergent bottle with a paper label. The detergent bottle goes to the HDP end market, the plastics end market. The paper label comes off in the wash cycle and does not get recycled. As such, it's not going to get credit for being recycled as it would be if it was a paper label, for example, on a paper box. So um, it discounts it even though the paper is technically a recyclable element. It isn't in the, in the context of how it's being uh, sent to market. Thanks, Dan. The, the next one, Andrew, I'm happy to answer. Yeah. Maybe because it's an easy one. I only like the easy questions. But it's a, again, it's a great question. Does selecting potential versus current package have any impact on the calculation? Or is it only for documentation purposes? So the answer is, simple answer is, no, it has no impact on the calculation. But this is one of the nice features of the tool that you can run comparative analysis. And so you saw Lucas give some examples of where he looks at some potential packages and where the, the pathways to improving the scores might go. And this is what we like about the tool. And maybe Lucas, do you want to comment on that in terms of potential packages? Um, just, yeah, building off what you just said, it's, uh, it's just been really powerful of just really getting to quantify and get a score for each of those different decisions we make, whether that be going from 25 to 30% or switching to a uh, polypropylene cap or a PET cap, we're able to quantify and capture each of those improvements and document them. Um, but yeah, no, it's a really great feature in the tool. Thanks, Lucas. And then this next one, uh, it, it, it is in the 50% recycled content water bottle example, what does the 59.3% value refer to? Is it the weighted average for the recycling performance of PET across the country? I think this is for you, Dan. Uh, yes, it is. Sure answer. Again, it's prorated to population. Uh, this does not mean that it's exactly 59.3 because um, relative to population, it may not be exact, but again, proportionally, that's how it is measured. Thanks, Dan. And the next one is, uh, again, one of those ones you have to think about a little bit, but it's important that it's included in the tool now in terms of version two. And that is, can you explain 
more how material intensity to product to package ratio affects the circularity score. So maybe just go over that example you were thinking of uh, a little bit more slowly for the questioner here. Okay. What we do is packaging, it, it's, long, it's been a longstanding issue in the, in the world about how much packaging do you put around a product to get it to market? Um, you know, there's a constant debate about what's excess packaging, what's the right amount of packaging, how much packaging do you need, recognizing that the role of packaging is to get your product to market safely so that the consumer can consume the product safely uh, and completely. So, um, but do you really need, you know, one of the, the uh, people, one of the areas that people focus on is cosmetics, for example, do you really need a uh, container and then inside like another container inside a box with a bunch of other information on it and then a stand up display, et cetera. So how much is really needed? And as such, if you're comparing packaging of products versus one another, less packaging to get the same product to market is better. But also for your own purposes of understanding uh, and making sure that we're giving you a good score is if your package, you know, you're delivering, I used a, a one liter of milk to two liters of milk with a glass bottle of 200 and, and 250 grams, which by the way, aren't right, right weights, but give you an example, is they would both score the same. They, they really would because the way the PIP 360 model works right now is it looks at the, if it's only a one element material, uh, package. So in other words, just glass, we're not even including the cap or anything, then whether the glass bottle weighs 200 grams or weighs two kilograms, it's going to give you the exact same score. But a 200 gram bottle delivering a liter of milk versus a two kilogram bottle delivering a liter of milk speaks to, wow, that's 10 times the amount of packaging to deliver the same amount of milk. Is that reasonable? And as such, when the users were looking at it going, well, how come I'm getting the same score regardless? And uh, believe it or not, it was in dealing with somebody in, uh, we were looking at eggs delivered to market and we were looking at molded pulp across the board <laughs> and whether they were delivering six, 12 or 18 eggs in their packaging, it gave exactly the same score. But when you start adding in packaging intensity, you can start looking at it, well, hold on a second. The 18 package is much more is a, has a much better packaging intensity score and therefore should affect the score accordingly and give it a better score. Um, so that was built in. Now, in terms of what how much it affects it, it all depends on where the committee settles on its percentage of the score that will be assigned. Right now, that is not finalized, uh, so I can't speak to it. Um, but it will be incorporated in the score. I hope that helps under make it easy, easier to understand. Well, given that I've been going at this, Andrew, I guess you'll let me keep going. Agreed. Um, and there's a good question coming up here now for Luke and Louie. Yeah, which may and, be our and, last. I'd yeah, say which will be our last closer. one, and then we can wrap up. But I think this is one that we need to answer. Is, you know, Lucas and Louie, do you find your customers asking for this type of info on your packages? That's interesting. And are the results from this tool something you're able to use from a marketing standpoint? Louis, why don't we start with you and then we'll have L Lucas comment. Sure thing. The, uh, um, from what we have done so far with customers, uh, customers have not used it for marketing reasons, but have used it internally uh, to demonstrate to management some of the efforts that have been done to uh, meet the ESG KPIs that they have. And internally, we have done it as well to compare uh, different products that, that we want to bring to market. And uh, uh, although they're all fiber-based, it, it's always uh, interesting to see uh, what kind of, uh, of a result, comparative results we're gonna get between two different options to package the same, uh, the same item. Lucas? Yeah, I guess just to add to that, I think from its inception, I mean, the goal of PIP 360 was never to, I guess, in a way, weaponize scores in any way, but really provide a certain degree of transparency where 
all members involved uh, throughout the value chain of the packaging really have to uh, put themselves out there and really evaluate how do these different materials and substrates perform in the waste streams because that's ultimately how we'll get to true circularity. Uh, I guess uh, just speaking and sticking to plastics, uh, there's a good discussion to be had that, you know, today the new plastics economy isn't about using the most PCR. It's about more brands introducing some PCR into their products. Funding the shift of this new, of these, or these new uh, innovative sorting and recycling uh, uh, streams finding that equilibrium between sorting and usage quantities. So mandates are never demanding more post-consumer uh, resin than is available. And a tool like PIP360 is great to quickly uh, see how uh, different waste currently performs in the streams it is being sold into and also support building pathways to maximize that circularity, uh, no matter the substrate. But uh, yeah, going back to just the question, it's, it's really at the brand's discretion, but uh, yeah, we're all working towards the same thing. Got it. Thanks so much, Lucas there. And, and we're nearly to the top of the hour. So uh, on behalf of Alan and Dan, I wanna thank Louis and Lucas for making the time to join us today. We really appreciate it. And to our webinar audience, um, great to have you with us. Uh, we hope you learned something new today. So if you have any questions whatsoever, whatsoever about PIP360, please feel free to reach out to any of the three of us. Uh, and our contact information will be in the webinar recording, which Lindsay on the PAC team will send out in the next day or two. So in the meantime, please stay healthy, stay safe, keep a smile on your faces, and we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye-bye. Cheers.